Good afternoon. Would you like to have a brief, but wildly exciting conversation about social science? Why, yes, I think I would. Great. I want to tell you a bit about a paper I've recently read by Norbert Schwartz and colleagues. Sounds great. What's it about? Well, it has to, to do with research methodology. That sounds a bit complicated, but I think I understand what you're talking about. Is this paper going to tell me something about how I ought to conduct social science? Yes. Precisely. This paper has to do with something called self-report data. Are you familiar with this term? Vaguely. Can you give me just a bit of background? Sure. Sometimes we social scientists are interested in questions about people that involve measurements that are difficult to make. How do you mean? Can you give me an example? Sure. Let's say I'm interested in how much sleep most people get. In the ideal world, I'd be able to creep into people's rooms at night with my laptop computer and record some very precise measurements about exactly when they fall asleep and when they wake up. I think I follow. I've got to say, though, that you social scientists are starting to worry me with your willingness to creep into bedrooms. Well, this is sort of my point. It's preposterous to suggest actually snooping around like this, so we need to find other solutions for getting the information we want. Hum. I understand the dilemma. Forgive me if this answer is too basic, or too obvious, but what if we simply ask people how many hours they sleep? Great suggestion. This is exactly what we're discussing when we talk about self-report data. It's important to keep in mind that, like any other form of measurement, this type of data will have some problems, but this strategy for gathering information will be a reasonable first start. What sort of problems might there be? Well, really there could be a lot of issues, but Norbert Schwartz is going to focus on one very specific sort of problem. Tell me about it. Well, a really general issue that Norbert Schwartz talks about in several papers is the idea that the way you ask a question has an impact on the answers you get. Well, it seems like there are a lot of different ways to ask a question. Do you mean something like the tone of voice you use while asking someone? Well, not exactly. Norbert Schwartz is going to be really interested in something called the response scales that people are given. Response scale? I'm not sure I understand. Well, often when we ask people questions, we also give them a specific set of responses to choose from. When I talk about a response scale, I'm just referring to these pre-specified options. Interesting. Yes. These response scales are important because it turns out that the scale a person is given has an impact on what data she reports. Well, of course. If you give people different options to choose from, it makes sense that their responses will be different. This point seems pretty trivially obvious. Well, it is a bit more complicated than that. Let's take Norbert Schwartz's example about television viewership. When we ask people how much television they watch, it's important that our scale is able to accommodate any amount of viewing. This minimal requirement still leaves us a lot of choice about how to group viewing times together. For example, we could ask whether people watch more or less than two hours each day. Or instead, whether they watch more or less than three hours a day. Ah, I'm beginning to see what you mean about the amount of choice. Norbert Schwartz, interested in this problem, discovered that the way we divide the scale impacts people's reports. For example, if a scale has a lot of response options at the low end, people are more likely to report lower numbers. Fascinating. What's more, Norbert Schwartz also asked people to estimate how much television is watched by the average person. Here too, people report lower numbers when the scale provides more options at the low end. This seems really crazy. Why does all this happen? Great question. There might be several different psychological mechanisms which are responsible for all this, but the explanation given by the authors of the paper has to do with something we now call reactivity. The general idea is that people who are asked questions might learn something from the structure of the response options they are given. Although Schwartz doesn't talk about this explicitly, this result concords with research by Paul Grys on something called conversational maxims. Maxim, like a rule? Exactly. Grise specified four rules of conversation, which are often alluded to in social science research. For the case we're talking about, one of these, the maxim of relevance, seems important. I can guess what the maxim of relevance is about. 
This means that people who are having a conversation must stick to the topic at hand, right? Yes, exactly. If, in the midst of this conversation, I started to babble about the animated blue blobs behind me, I would be violating this rule of relevance. The reason this might be important for Schwartz's study is that people who are asked questions which have many response options at the low end are likely to infer that the researcher expects that they watch television at some point in this range. Let me see if I've got this. Because of the maximum of relevance, people who are given a response scale which is finely divided in a particular range might conclude that the researcher has a particular expectation about their response. Yes. Exactly. And this is linked to what we now call reactivity, or the act of learning something from the response options given? Yes. Perfect. Wow. This is very exciting. Where did you read this, and how can I learn more? The particular paper we've been discussing appeared in the Public Opinion Quarterly, Volume 49 Number 3 in 1985, so we've really known about this for quite some time. If this sort of discussion was interesting for you, you might really enjoy a course in judgment and decision-making, or behavioral economics. Very interesting. Thanks.